Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour and Company. Here's what's coming up. Our commitment is to do what's necessary to keep every single member of our community safe and to tell the truth that the Minneapolis police are not doing that. The first step in the defunding debate, what will policing look like? I asked sociologist Alex Vitali and Black Lives Matter strategist Tenjiwe Makaris. Then, Senator Mitt Romney marches with protesters in Washington and steps out from the Republican Party ranks. GOP Congressman Adam Kinzinger joins me. Plus, this whole episode um, further uh, erodes the, the credibility of, of the U.S. Our Walter Isaacson talks to the Financial Times editor Rula Khalaf about America's moral standing in the world. Amanpour and Company is made possible by Rosalind P. Walter, Bernard and Irene Schwartz, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, Candace King Weir, The Anderson Family Fund, The Cheryl and Philip Milstein Family, Charles Rosenblum, The Strauss Family Foundation, Jeffrey Katz and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiane Amanpour, working from home in London. Another weekend of protests over the killing of George Floyd, both here and in the United States. Demonstrators in Bristol pulled down the statue of an infamous slave trader and pushed it into the harbor where his ships once left to collect their human cargo. While in Minneapolis, the first signs that black lives do matter are coming from the city council. It's pledging to dismantle the police department and it's promising a shift towards community-based strategies instead. However, like the mayor of Minneapolis, not everyone agrees that abolishing the entire department is the right approach. As Congress proposes sweeping new legislation aimed at eliminating police brutality, we want to take just a moment to remember what leadership in the face of historic injustice looked like. The day after Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, Robert F. Kennedy made a famous speech, and here's an excerpt of that audio recording, which is also covered with images from right now. Whenever any American's life is taken unnecessarily, whether it is done in the name of the law or in defiance of the law, whenever we do this, then the whole nation is degraded. And yet it goes on and on and on in this country of ours. Too often we excuse those who are willing to build their own lives on the shattered dreams of other human beings. Some accuse others of rioting and inciting riots have by their own conduct invited them. This is the violence of institutions, indifference, inaction, and decay. This is the violence that afflicts the poor, that poisons relations between men because their skin has different colors. This is the slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books. This is the breaking of a man's spirit by denying him the chance to stand as a father and as a man amongst other men. We learn at the last to look at our brothers as alien. For when you teach a man to hate and to fear his brother, when you teach that he is a lesser man because of his color, then you also learn to confront others, not as fellow citizens, but as enemies, to be met not with cooperation, but with conquest, to be subjugated and to be mastered. We learn to share only a common fear, only a common impulse to meet disagreement with force. But this much is clear. Violence breeds violence, repression breeds retaliation, and only a cleansing of our whole society can remove this sickness from our souls. We must admit the vanity of our false distinctions and learn to find our own advancement in search for the advancement of all. That was leadership then, incredible words that crucially acknowledge the role of the state and its institutions in the cycle of violence against black communities, which continues to this day. 
With me to discuss what defunding the police actually means, what it looks like, is Professor Alex Vitali, the coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at the Brooklyn College, and Tenjiwe Makaris, an organizer with the Movement for Black Lives. Both of you, welcome to the program. Tenjiwe, I wonder if I could start with you, because Robert F. Kennedy was a leader, and he was white. And I've heard in the aftermath, obviously, of what's happening right now, that many people in the black community are tired and don't believe that their elected, mostly white leaders, can do the job, that it has to be black communities in their own communities, on the streets, etc. Do you agree with that? Is it time to, to, to take the initiative away from the traditional leadership? Well, well first, thank you for, for having me. Um, I just want to start off by saying I am so moved and so inspired by black movement, black leadership, people taking to the streets across the country from Minneapolis to St. Louis, to Los Angeles, to New York. We are watching something that is so historic, so profound, and really is a number of things. But one thing it is, it is an outcry from the belly of the streets, from the homes of black people across this country, sharing that we are done watching our people die. We are done watching our loved ones be snatched from us. And it is also, it is also people across the country saying that we will no longer be told that demanding what we deserve is impossible, that it is not practical, and that it is not something that could happen. We believe that we can win. We believe that we can actually have safety in this country. In terms of elected officials, we have watched from the White House to the mayor in Minneapolis say that certain things like um, uh, reimagining public safety in localities or defunding the police across the country is not something that is possible or not the right choice. It is clear that we have elected officials in every level of government in this country that is not centering the needs of the people or even the rights of protesters, that is centering the needs of the wealthy, that is centering the needs of those that do not have the best interest of people or the planet at heart. And so our position is, one is that we elected officials who are not able to center our needs should not have the positions that they have. And that the, the solution to the problem, that the solution to how we fix this issue of anti-black racism, of injustice in this country has to come from the mouths has to come from the truth of communities. We have been saying this for generations. Mm -hmm. We will continue to say this for generations. So very quickly, before I turn to Alex Vitali for some, some sort of sociological details, are you pleased then? Is it a big step in the right direction, what the uh, Minneapolis City Council did and talked about dismantling the police department there and shifting, uh, shifting the sort of, you know, the emphasis? Absolutely. It, it's a lightning rod to the rest of the country of what is possible. And it's also a product of the courageous, bold leaders on the ground in Minneapolis. I think now more than a time, uh, more than ever, we need to be thinking about what, what is community-led safety infrastructure that will take its place? What is a way to defund and divest from policing as, as, it, as it exists now and investing in the actual needs of our communities? Mm. Uh, let me let me turn to you, Alex, for a moment and just ask you to explain to us who might not get it, what exactly is defund and abolish? Because as you can imagine, those words in different communities can mean different things. And it could be sort of a, you know, a sort of a red flag to a bull to those who you want to try to convince. So what does it actually mean? Well, I'm glad to have the chance to explain it because it's hard to reduce these ideas down to a cardboard sign or a tweet. I, I think Ms. McCarris did a great job of explaining that we're really talking about looking at our gross over-reliance on policing in the United States and searching in every possible way to replace that with alternatives designed to build up people, to build up communities rather than criminalizing them. And this is really a reaction to, to 40 years of American politicians turning every social problem under the sun, especially in low income and communities of color, over to the police to manage. And people are demanding that we find better solutions. We're looking at a huge, uh, I want to say mural, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's painted on the streets in Washington, D.C., that 
legend, that slogan, defund the police, uh, on those two blocks of 16th Street that go towards the White House. Uh, I, I want to ask you, though, again, for people who say, oh, what do you mean, abolish the police? Then who do you call if there's a violent crime or, or whatever? What is, what is your answer to that? Sure. No one's talking about a situation where tomorrow there's some magical switch and there are no police. What we're talking about is an interrogation of the specific things that police are doing, which have caused significant harms, have reproduced race and class inequality in America, and demanding that we develop non-policing solutions. Does that mean that at the end of this process there are no police? Well, we don't know what is at the end of this process. It's about communicating with communities about what their needs are that have been ignored by government for generations now and demanding that they no longer turn those things over to folks whose tools for solving their problems are guns and handcuffs, coercion and threats. Um, so, Tanjiri McHarris, it seems to already be working in some instances, like New York City and I think L.A. have said that they're going to shift um, considerable amounts of their budget to more social, uh, not, not social services, but social reactions to social issues that, that are now being confused with criminal issues and, you know, calling out the police for issues that potentially police shouldn't. Uh, respond to. And I just want to point out for our viewers that actually the city of Camden, New Jersey, um, did actually disband the police department and did rebuild it. And that created a massive drop by about two thirds in murder rates and homicides from 2012 when it happened um, to now, so 2019. So can you sort of try to give us, uh, Tenji, a, a bit of a chapter and verse as to what issues would require what kind of services to deal with them other than, than police? Sure, and I'm happy you asked this question. And so, you know, oftentimes people, when we think of, when we talk about defunding the police or abolishing the police or an ending to, to policing um, the way, as it exists now in this country, um, the reaction is, so then what do I do in a moment of crisis or a moment of need? And I think what is clear to so many of us is everyone deserves access to safety. Everyone deserve, deserves a way that they can reach out to a centralized source to get, to get help when they need it. What exists now, however, is one tactic that is often a failed tactic um, for the multiple different needs, for the various um, different crises that people have. So whether it's mental health, or homelessness, or a dispute. Um, we there are there are a number of different types of people, or and, and specialists, whether it's social workers, mental health professionals, people who are violence interrupters, who are trained and oftentimes community-based, who can respond in moments of crisis. What we have um, now is an opportunity to um, reimagine public safety, to reimagine if you have a need, if you have a crisis, that you can actually get the support, the services that you need. Um, and in this moment, Black people, people across working class, poor communities across this country, they're, we're screaming, we need and we deserve safety too. And policing, the way it exists in, in, in this country, does not give us that. And just quickly, because again, everybody will say, uh, and your opponents on this will say, well, well, what happens when they're, you know, aggravated assault and, and those kind of crimes that, I mean, perhaps, I mean, presumably are out of the reach of the more social service experts that you're talking about? What do you expect to see in those cases? Well, I, I'm also happy that you asked this question. And this is what I mean about infrastructure. We need the type of infrastructure that takes into account multiple types of emergencies, multiple types of crises. And what we're not saying is that um, we don't need people who are trained to deal with that level of crisis, people that have to deal with that level of violence. Um, there, there, there will likely be um, or possibly there will be opportunities where we do need it. But what we're saying is we need the type of full infrastructure that could deal with the multiple types of crises that is community led and that also at the end of the day centers people and harm reduction. And what we have right now is a police force that not just sort of is not capable of addressing harm adequately across our communities, but is not able to give safety and is actually increasing the violence in our country. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Alex, obviously, you know, it begs the question because we see a very militarized looking police force, the way they dress, the weapons they carry, the vehicles they use, etc., and the actions that we've seen on the streets, even in this time when there should be extra sensitivity. It's extraordinary what we've been seeing. But I want to ask you this, because obviously other countries, other democracies, don't have this kind of similar police situation. For instance, in places like New Zealand or Iceland or Norway or the UK, the police are largely unarmed. But as you know better than I do, in the United States, according to the latest polls, some 40% of people people and households have guns. There's something like 310 million guns in circulation in the United States right now. How much of a complicating factor is that for the issues that you want to see changed right now in policing? Well, it's clear that the legacy of armed violence in the United States is a factor here, but it's a factor in both the level of police violence and the level of community violence. But we can deal with that if we're given the opportunity. We have research that shows that when we utilize highly qualified, well-resourced violence interruption programs located in communities, that we can break that cycle of violence. We can dramatically reduce homicide numbers and the number of shootings without getting the police involved. But what we need is the opportunity to do that. So this is not about tomorrow, you know, we take the guns away from the police. This is about addressing the factors that drive gun usage. You know, in Canada, there are a lot of people who own guns and people don't shoot each other. It's very rare there. We need to address what's driving the violence. And what do you think, Tenjiwe, when we started by talking about elected leaders and the traditional, you know, areas of, of legislation, and as you know, the House has, um, is passing a bill which is called the Justice and Policing Act of 2020, which is apparently one of the biggest efforts in recent history to address police violence, to ad address, you know, accountability and, and the like. Do you, do you expect that to sort of trickle down? I mean, I guess I ask you because there was quite a lot of reform, incredibly, in the Minnesota Police Department, and it clearly did not work in terms of what happened to uh, George Floyd. So what, what hope do you hold for what's happening in Congress now with this new act? I, ju I just want to say what is clear is across the country is that these reforms are failing. The Minneapolis Police Department was a model for, for, for sort of, quote, unquote, good policing. They had uh, policies around de-escalation. Um, they banned sort of warrior trainings. Um, they engaged in a number of different practices and adopted policies um, that held them up as a model police department. George Floyd still died. Um, in New York City, when Eric Garner was killed, um, there was already a chokehold ban within the NYPD. What we're seeing is these policies, these incremental changes are failing to keep our people safe, are failing to keep our people alive. What we know is true is that we need structural change. It's clear. It's the most rational decision that we, uh, that we have before us, that these, these policies are just not sufficient. And so in terms of Congress, even at the federal level, we know $100 billion goes to policing nationwide. And we know federal dollars are funneling to state and local um, police department. And this is not just for local officials. This is also for those um, on the Hill in D.C. It's that reforms that really just deal with trainings, that try to deal with de-escalation, but that do not fundamentally deal with the scope and the power of policing as it currently exists will not work. Our people, the movement calls for defunding of the police and investing in our communities. Any sh anything short of that is a failure to the people and does it not meet the needs of our community. So to that point about budgets and, 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 the, and the amount of money, you, you just mentioned $100 billion. Well, 
Six billion of those dollars go to the NYPD, which apparently is larger than the GDP of 50 countries around the world, and it's also larger than the WHO budget. In Minneapolis, which we were just talking about, the police budget was $193 million. In contrast, community organizations working with at-risk youths and the like were receiving just a quarter of a million, 250,000 US dollars. Alex, how did the role of the police become so outsized in the United States. Was there a turning point moment? There were a few turning point moments, and it's tied to a set of economic changes and political priorities. I think we see, beginning with the Nixon administration, an attempt to kind of weaponize crime fighting as a tool for gaining political votes in the wake of the civil rights movement, a kind of toxic racial dog whistling. But that that became a bipartisan problem of defunding social services to subsidize the already most successful parts of the economy, a kind of neoliberal austerity politics that then produces problems like mass homelessness, mass untreated mental illness, large scale involvement in black market activity by those who are under and unemployed. And then as those problems emerge, they're turned over to policing to manage rather than trying to build affordable housing, put young people to work in stable employment, or create a mental health infrastructure. So it's a problem that's been developing over decades, and it's going to take us a while to get out of it. And I'm excited about the extent to which we're, we're getting this to be taken seriously. So then last question to you, Tenji Weimakaris. Are you excited? I mean, I hate to ask you that over something that was just so appalling, uh, the murder of, of George Floyd, but are you excited that this could be a turning point? And, and particularly by the polls that we're seeing out there that, that really support the community and uh, by the world's involvement as well. Are you, do you think this will stick or is there a little bit of cynicism or worry that, you know, like before, some things may not change? You know, I feel, I feel a multiple, uh, I feel a number of different things. One, one, I'm heartbroken. I'm heartbroken for all the George Floyds, all the Breonna Taylors. I'm heartbroken that, um, that so many of our people had to die. Um, but I have to say, I am, I have never been more inspired than I am now. I can feel in the spirit of these, of this moment. And what I see happening in the streets, people rising up. I feel this deep commitment that we are committed to, to having our, our, our needs met. We are committed to not just demanding what we think we'll get. We are committed to demanding everything, not just we deserve, but our ancestors deserve. And more importantly, that our children coming, the ones that have not been born yet, we are committed to creating a world where they get to be safe. So I'm heartbroken, but I have never been more in love and more inspired by the bold, courageous, beautiful black movement that I see happening right now. Tenjiwe Makaris and uh, Alex Vitali, thank you both very much for joining us on this important and of the moment topic. Now, the big question in making radical change happen is, will Republicans get on board? They weren't present when Democrats developed the legislation that we were talking about and look unlikely to support it. So far, only one Republican senator has showed solidarity with the protesters in a very visible way, and that is Mitt Romney, who was marching in Washington this weekend. While the head of the Justice Department, the Attorney General William Barr, kept saying that he doesn't believe racism is systemic in the police force. Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger has just returned from a deployment with the National Guard in Wisconsin, and he's joining, um, he's joining me now. Um, Congressman, welcome to the program. I, I guess you heard quite a lot of what we were just discussing, and it is the hot discussion right now. And it has been tried in other places, and it seems with some success. Who knew until we looked into it? What do you think about this? And do you agree that there needs to be radical change in policing? 
Yeah, I think there does need to be change. I think it's, uh, you know, what does that look like? Uh, I don't fully know. You know, I don't know exactly what they're bringing in front of the Congress. We just heard about this bill basically coming today. Some of it sounds good, but the devil's always in the details. You know, how do we, how do we, I think a couple of things. How do you screen to make sure that the right people are coming into the police force? How do you ensure that they're accountable to each other and accountable to leadership to say, if you see abuse happening, there's something you need to do about it? Uh, you know, and how do we keep them safe? But I think where, where this argument gets derailed, quite honestly, and what I'm worried about, because I do want to see real change happen, is that both sides kind of go to some pretty extreme corners on this. And one of those is the idea of defund the police. Now, I've noticed that people talking about defund the police are trying to change the, the talk a little bit and say, well, we just want to reduce some of the funding and put it into social services. But this started as defund and abolish the police. And that is where you're going to lose all Republicans. You'll lose a lot of Democrats, frankly, on that, uh, as we saw with the mayor in, uh, in Minneapolis. But I do think that there is an opportunity to say what's going wrong, how do we fix it? Because I always think back to the, that shooting in Houston where there were people protesting police abuse. And then you had that shooter that came out and actually police and the protesters worked together to save each other. And so I think we all have to try to work together on this if we want to see real change. So I guess uh, obvious question, I assume you believe this given what you've just said. I mean, most people, most, many, particularly around the world as well, are saying that America has failed its black people. It's just failed. And there needs to be so much fundamental change. And there are members of your own party who don't even admit that there is systemic racism anywhere, much less in, just in the police. Do you believe there's systemic racism? And do you admit that America well, I, has failed uh, the black community? Well, look, those are both kind of loaded questions. And I think we have to take them apart a little bit. Systemic racism implies in the definition that there are laws that favor a certain race. I think we have made some massive progress. And anybody that doubts that, all you have to do is look back to the 60s and see where we're at today. But there's a lot more process to go. I think it's very inflammatory to call it systemic, but instead to say there's still examples of failure. So if you have a police officer with his knee on a guy's neck for nine minutes suffocating him to death, that is a huge problem. And there is systemic issues within that police department is that always the case within the country? I don't know. And I think that's a big, a big leap to jump to. And I think, again, it puts us in our corners because some people say, well, we've made a huge progress. It's not systemic. Others say, no, it is systemic. We have to learn to see this through each mm. other's eyes. But I think there certainly is progress would, would, that needs to be made. OK. Would institutional suit you better than systemic? Institutional racism? I think to an extent, it depends, again, where you look. When you paint the country with a broad brush, this is what our enemies overseas love seeing. By the way, China, who does far worse than this in oppressing uh, you know, Muslim minorities and everything that they do. Uh, but if you look at the reality, yes, we have a lot of way to go. I think, though, when you paint everything with a broad brush, you put people in their corners. So to go to the thing of saying we still have laws and everything, no. Do we have attitudes? Yes. We have racist attitudes in this country that we have to get rid of. And we've got to set up systems, however we do that in place, so that, for instance, racist behavior of a police officer is turned in by his fellow officers, and we get rid of that in that process. Well, as you know, uh, on the other side of this debate, and it's a very gathering debate, there is call for much more than just getting rid of a few so-called bad apples. Obviously, you know that, and, and clearly that's necessary. Um, we'll talk about China in just a second. Um, but I, I, I want to ask you, you know, do you not find it troubling that Republicans have not engaged in this act that is uh, passing, you know, that, that's on, ongoing in the House right now? Um, do you not find it a little troubling that when we see not just images, the reality of back during the debate over easing lockdown uh, from coronavirus, when you had armed people, I mean, armed to the teeth with military style weapons going into a state legislature, I'm talking about Michigan, threatening elected officials and... We're told by the highest levels of, of elected democracy in your country, the president calls, you know, there were good people there. And not a peep, not a peep. And yet the peaceful protesters over this are 
have their constitutional rights abused. I mean, there is a problem. You say people go into their corners, but in this case, don't you admit that that's a major hypocrisy and a double standard? I think there's a lot of double standards here. First off, you know, when people that wanted to open up, and, and I condemned already people, you know, showing up to the state house okay. with guns. But when you had people in Springfield, Illinois, that were protesting it, and they were told that they're going to kill people because they're not social distancing, and three weeks later we see protests and not a peep of that, right? That can be a problem as well. But I, look, I've supported everybody's right to protest. Where I have had an issue with what's gone on in the last week is the violence and destruction, which nobody has a right to do. And even the president, and I condemn the president's words a lot, as you well know, but even the president never came out, at least that I know of, and said people don't have a right to protest. He may have not spoken about that as genteelly as I certainly would have, but he did say, and I agree, people don't have a right to burn things down and loot. And that's where the issue comes down to. Peaceful protest is absolutely fine. If people want to, it, you know, I said they shouldn't have at the time, protest the lockdowns. They have a right to do that now. Um, but we have got to get to that where it's not just, isn't your side terrible or isn't that side terrible? Because we're never going to solve anything. That's my frustration, I think, with the debates that are occurring nowadays. I mean, look, I'm, I'm not going to speak to, for everybody. I'm a journalist, but I think you well know that the majority of the protest leaders, the peaceful protest leaders, they also don't believe in burning things down. I mean, this is, as you know, groups of agitators who've been named and listed and arrested and documented by police departments, uh, you know, from, from coast to coast. So these aren't the, yep. the, the protesters, these are agitators. So I want to ask you then, because you say the president agreed that peaceful protests, and yes, he did. He's given lip service to peaceful protests. But then he gives this order to violently clear, clear as you know, using National Guard and the like, a peaceful protesters outside the White House in order for him to walk across Lafayette to Lafayette Square to try to... Um, you know, do some kind of a photo up in front of a church. What do you think about that? I ask you because you have an active duty background. You've just been in the National Guard service uh, for a few days. You've seen what other members of the military have said about this. Where do you come down on that? Well, I've heard two different versions of what happened, so I'll address each of them. One is that the decision was made to clear that that morning because of, you know, it being too close to the White House and the security issue. Uh, that was a legitimate decision, if that's the case, if there's a security concern. If the decision was made that we need to clear this area so that the president can go do a photo op, that would have been absolutely wrong. I've heard both versions of that. One would be a OK version, which is there is a security buffer we need. And then the president, after it was clear, made the decision, which he had a right to do. But I think if, in fact, it was cleared so that you could do a photo op, then that's wrong. I've heard all versions of that. I don't know which is correct, quite honestly, but that would be my take on whichever one it ends up being in history when we find out. But to be fair, um, I'm sure you've been at quite a few of these gatherings. I've certainly watched a lot of protests and a lot of clearing of buffer zones, and they really don't have to be that violent. I mean, they just don't. So the other question, of course, is more to the point. Um, there's been a huge amount of criticism of the idea, the very idea of deploying active duty forces against Americans in the streets of America. Where do you stand on that? So that active duty forces, and there's a large misunderstanding right now between the role of the National Guard when it's not under active duty orders, like what you're seeing in the case of now, uh, versus if it's you know used overseas in war. Active duty forces, short of basically a failure of state government or a threat of overthrow of the federal government, should not be utilized on U.S. streets. National Guard, on the other hand, should when they need to be, because the National Guard is actually acting in service to the police department and in service to the governor, with the exception of D.C., mm -hmm. because D.C., after the Assumption Act, the president is actually acts as the governor of the district and the district guard. So uh, these, in every case you've seen, uh, have actually been guardsmen under the governor of that area. Active duty forces, no yeah. uh, threat to the federal government should not be deployed. 
Right, but as you know, the president was talking about it, and he even on that conference call with governors called them weak and wimpy and how they need to dominate the space and all of that. Um, clearly, that's been, you know, roundly criticized by everybody from defense secretaries to former joint chiefs, etc. But the Wall Street Journal poll released over the weekend found that 59% of Americans were more concerned about police violence that led to the death of George Floyd than protests that turned violent. 80% of those surveyed said that things are out of control in the country. Now, that, to me, is a really significant poll. 59% of the people of the United States believe that they are more concerned about the police violence that led to George Floyd's death. Are you all reading the street, reading your voters, reading the people well enough when you take your decisions and make your statements and, and speeches? For me, yes, because I I understand where that poll comes from, because the issue of the police violence is something that's been uh, long term. And until we do something, it's going to continue. The street violence and the protests we saw was short term. That was a couple days of basically 10 days, I think, so far of protesting. So that's a short term concern, whereas the longer term concern is this. That's why we need to address the issue in policing, but without saying things like defund the police, because I've heard many even black leaders say that that is going to frighten people and not what they believe in, but they want serious reforms. I think we all do. Um, I, 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 I know that police budgets and this and that are, are dealt with by governors, but they are humongous. We just heard something like $100 billion um, go to police departments around the country. I quoted in New York alone the NYPD is $6 billion, which is bigger than 50 countries' GDP, bigger than the whole of the WHO budget, and we're in the middle of a pandemic, remember? That seems to have somewhat um, gone down the list of, of news priorities. Um, but th surely America's money can be spent better in order to get better results, better goals, and create, you know, more peace in, in the country. Yeah, I mean, maybe. It, de it depends. See, a significant amount of police budgets go to things like pension. And pension systems are, are pretty serious in this country in terms of needing reform, especially if you look in Illinois. That's where a lot of that goes. It's not all like MRAPs and that comes, you know, surplus from the military. We can have a debate about that, but that's not going to be built into the budget. A lot of it is training. A lot of it is, you know, body armor, body cameras. We want all these things on police. And then, you know, if somebody calls the police and it takes 30 minutes to get service, they're upset about that because you need more police officers. So I think it's a lot more than just saying we're just blowing money on police departments. When you take a place like New York City that has to have a counterterrorism unit as well as, you know, 50,000 officers or something like that, there's a huge cost to it. So can we I'm always for looking at budgets and saying, where do we cut waste out? Um, but at a time when we're talking about training people better, especially in community policing, I'm not sure if reducing budget is going to help very much. And it's certainly going to increase response time when there is a shooting or something that somebody needs a response to. Just keep in mind, we're just coming off a spate of school shootings. I have a good friend who's a police officer that stopped a school shooting in Dixon, Illinois, because he was right there at school. That costs money, too, to have people forward located. Uh, of course, and we talked about the pr predominance of guns in the country and also what does happen when you actually need to call a police if there is an armed, uh, you know, an, an armed crime underway and you need help. This is a debate that's going to continue. Uh, Congressman Kinzinger, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Now, many of America's allies around the world are looking on aghast. The Financial Times editorial about the Trump administration's crackdown on peaceful protests is titled America's Battered Moral Standing. Rula Khalaf is the paper's new editor and the first woman to hold that post. She says this is undermining Washington's ability to hold the high ground with authoritarian regimes abroad. Here she's talking to our Walter Isaacson about the challenges of these turbulent times. Thank you, Christian and Rula. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This past uh, week, we saw the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square uprising. It was uh, commemorated in Hong Kong by huge protests. And there were also huge protests around the United States and in certain places around the world because of the killing of George Floyd. What was going through your head as you saw the protests around the world and especially how the protests were playing out 
in the United States? Um, I think this is a this is a really good point because uh, the the U.S. of course has reacted to the Hong Kong uh, protests um, in the way that one would expect, um, but the president has not reacted to the U.S. protests in the way that one would expect. Um, and I think this is the difference that shocks and dismays um, a lot of people ar around the world. Uh, because what, what credibility uh, does the U.S. have uh, when it calls uh, on, um, on Hong the Hong Kong authorities or the Chinese authorities um, to uh, treat protesters better, uh, peaceful protesters, um, with respect? when in, in the US itself, the call is you know, to send the army out and when you know, protesters are being removed so that the president can have a photo uh, of. So I think this whole episode um, further uh, erodes the, the credibility of, of the US, but also the moral authority of the US. I mean, I've covered a lot of protests in, in, in my career, in revolutions and, and uprisings. And everyone uh, would look to the US, would hang on every word that the State Department or, or the White House would, would utter is, and there's always been the belief that if the, that the US is the only um, outside power that can make a difference and that can have, um, that can exert pressure on, on governments to actually act. Um, and not to um, and not to deal with protests uh, forcefully and not to crack down on peaceful protests. When you saw the killing of George Floyd, the knee on the neck and him gasping, saying he couldn't breathe, what re what ramifications, repercussions did that have both in Britain and in Europe? Um, I think very similar um, to the repercussions that any you know American would have would have uh, would have had. Um, it, of course, there's always a de delayed reaction if you're not in um, the country where um, such an outrage is um, act took place. So I think you know day after day. Um, the anger and the outrage felt uh, by um, people outside of the U.S. Uh, turned into protests. And I think pr the protests that I've seen in Europe and in the U.K., part of it is about uh, the killing of George Floyd, but I think part of it is also uh, about the discrimination that, that people feel in their own um, countries. Um, so I think this has been... I would say perhaps a, a wake up call for, for a lot of people. I mean, you know, on, on, a, on a personal level and on a professional level, um, I think it also makes you think about diversity in, in, in the workplace. And we talk a lot about diversity, but, you know, are we really diverse? I think this is the debate that's also going on in a lot of companies in Europe today. You've been an expert in covering China, both uh, as a journalist yourself and your newspaper. What do you see that the West would be doing or the Trump administration should be doing to get China policy back on an even keel? I think we're in a very, very tricky uh, situation uh, right now because a lot of the assumptions that the West has had about China, not least that economic prosperity would eventually lead uh, to a certain level of political liberalization. I mean, that assumption um, has not borne out. But what I think the Western governments also did not expect is the um, consolidation of power by uh, Xi Jinping and um, the, the increasing tilt towards even greater authoritarianism. Um, so this is on the Chinese side. On the US side, you have also had a hardening of, uh, of attitude, not just 
uh, in the White House, but across the political spectrum. Of course, the fact that um, the president also uh, uses China as uh, uh, a political football in his domestic in, in domestic politics as well that doesn't help. So what I now see is um, uh, an escalating spiral, um, and we we've just written an, an editorial about this where we said that. Uh, what we need is a kind of reset. You have to agree uh, with the Chinese to disagree on certain things. We're, no one is going to be in, uh, supportive of the policy in Hong Kong, uh, human rights violation, uh, a potential you know, hardening of Chinese attitudes towards, uh, towards Taiwan. But there are areas where you could still cooperate. Climate change is, is one of them, um, trade and commercial relations. And there has to be a, a, at least an attempt to separate what you can work with China on and what you cannot. I just want to push back there. You say we can cooperate on climate change. We can co cooperate on trade. But th that's those are things that the U.S. doesn't want to cooperate on. Yes. And, and this is where I was going, is am I optimistic about this? I'm not optimistic in uh, in the short term, no. Because I think that in the next few months, as we get closer to the U.S. election, I think this relationship is, uh, is going to de deteriorate further. Um, now, I think we have to start looking post the election, whether it is a Republican or a Democratic administration. Because I think once you've gone, you know, once you've moved away from um, the, the politicking, then maybe that can be the time uh, to rethink the relationship with, with, with China and to put it on a, on a different footing. And I also think that this is not just an issue between the US and China. You know, Europe is a major power here, and Europe has a role to play. Um, I think the Europeans in the past few months have uh, not actually just blindly gone behind uh, behind the U.S. Uh, the Huawei case, uh, for example, where both Germany and the U.K. have been a lot more balanced in, in their attitude to, to Huawei. At the core of what the Financial Times has stood for throughout its history, is the importance of free markets, free trade, free ideas, you know, a good economic system, a very sober-minded approach to the world. And yet over the past 20 or 30 years, we've seen this backlash against globalization, a backlash against free trade, against immigration, a, a sort of a populist feeling that uh, Financial Times readers should not be ruling uh, the world or consolidating Europe. What are the right. underlying... You mean the Davos elite. The Davos elite who subscribe to the Financial Times, their world has been upended by this populist backlash. What's the cause of that? Uh, and by the way, did we, and I'll put myself in the category of a Financial Times reader, get things wrong? Did we misunderstand the resentments that were being built up because of globalization, trade, and immigration? Um, I'll say a few things. Uh, first, I do think we have to remember uh, how much benefit globalization has brought, how many people um, were lifted out of poverty around the world. Um, I think that the reason that we have seen a rise in populist nationalism and a backlash against globalization is, is because of the way um, that it was managed or rather mismanaged um, in, in terms of its impact on, on certain community. I mean, you know, Brexit, for example, is, is an example of, of, uh, of the backlash. Um, and that is because, you know, what I think a lot of um, policymakers uh, forgot um, is that right around them, in their own backyard, that there, there was an impact that was not being uh, addressed. Um, that is, I think, one of the mistakes. I think the other is you have to go back to the financial crisis and the excess of, of the financial crisis. Um, often, uh, when you have big shocks, um, the ramifications aren't necessarily felt. Can, you know, not all the ramifications are felt right away. Some of it comes with a de delayed uh, reaction. Um, and I think 
part of this, the, 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 the new sort of sentiment of being anti-EU, anti-globalization has to do with the fact that inequality um, has widened um, in, in the last um, decade. And nothing was done about it. We were just, you know, moving ahead and thinking about the stock market. Um, and I think that it was almost, you know, it's, it was a, it's a wake up call. It's a wake up call to say, okay, what has gone wrong? Uh, how do we reset capitalism? Uh, what should be uh, the policies that are more distributive uh, without losing sight of the benefits uh, of, of globalization? I mean, we are, of course, and will always remain um, advocates of free trade and, and free markets because we think that that is where the econo economic benefit is for everyone. Um, but we also have to take into account um, the pitfalls, um, the, the, where it needs to be reset and, and reformed. But let me push back on you a little bit. Okay. Haven't the events in the recent five to 10 years caused you to question a little bit more the absolute benefits of free trade? Um, I wouldn't say to question, I would say um, to, to think a lot harder about the impact of free trade, not only on countries that are um, where production is cheaper, for example, but the impact on, you know, the UK, for, ex for, for example. And I mean, you say free trade, you can talk about free trade and free movement. And it, in the UK in particular, there were communities that should have should have been supported um, uh, at a time when borders were were completely open to other uh, EU nationals, and that and that didn't happen. So, you know, it's not a it's not a question of um, you know do I question it intellectually? I think um, questioning it, qu questioning the practice and the impact. Yes, certainly. And I mean, you know, we've written an awful lot about this. You're just coming out of lockdown now. This past week, you're taking the baby steps over there in Britain uh, to come out. Do you think that the timing is right? Are you sending your kid back to school, in other words? Um, I am. I sent my kid back to school uh, yesterday for, for the first time because his class uh, is back. Um, I think generally a lot of people still feel that we're coming out of lockdown early um, because the number of infections is still high, uh, the number of daily deaths is still higher than most other European countries. I think generally um, it is felt, and we certainly say that in our editorials at the FT, um, that this crisis was not well managed by the government. Of course, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson did himself get uh, sick um, and was in hospital for, for a while. And of course, that didn't um, help. Uh, but we feel that generally this has not been handled properly. And our concern is that as we come up, come out of the lockdown, uh, the test and trace system that is needed for an effective uh, easing um, is still not there yet. Well, as the Financial Times, you cover very much about the finances of the world, but also Europe and then Britain. Uh, do you think that with Brexit looming or coming down the pike, you not only need to figure out what the European Central Bank is going to do, but what the Bank of England is going to do? And how will that play out? The government's argument is that we should go ahead and have um, and leave the EU for good because we have already officially left the EU, whether we get a comprehensive deal um, with, with the European Union, or we could do it without a deal. And some of the arguments that you hear is that because their COVID uh, has had such a negative impact on, on the economy, um, and because we have to think anew about what the structure of the economy is, what the fundamentals are, what kind of economy we want, that we might as well just, you know, have Brexit at the end of the year with or without a deal. Most economists, however, and that is certainly a position held um, by, by uh, the FT, um, is that you are facing, you know, we're still dealing with a real shock. And we now see 
not only in Britain, but everywhere, what we are calling a recovery. Uh, but that is because we have, we've reached the bottom and we're coming back uh, up, whatever shape uh, this takes. But the reality is that there's, in a few months, we will know how much scarring there has been. And what I mean by that is we're not going to return to the same level that we were at just before the, the pandemic. Uh, so we will be facing uh, a very, very difficult economic situation with millions of people who are unemployed, with sectors that are completely uh, ravaged. And so it, it would be an added burden on businesses and on the economy to actually uh, leave the European Union at the end of the year without a deal, i.e. In, in, a, in a fashion that is not orderly. Thank you, Rula, for joining us. Thanks for having me. And again, so much of what's happening on the streets of the United States right now is being viewed here in the UK and around the world. And finally, amid powerful protests and speeches and local action to make Black Lives Matter, the testimony of a nine-year-old girl has resurfaced on social media. In September 2016, Ziana Oliphant gave an emotional address to the Charlotte City Council in North Carolina, a week after the fatal police, police shooting of Keith Scott. He was a 43-year-old black man. The then district attorney said that while police reported seeing Scott with a gun, there was no evidence to show that he had raised it. Take a listen now to the anguish of young Ziana Oliphant. Got, it's a shame that our fathers and mothers are killed and we can't even see them anymore. That's right. It's a shame that we have to go to the graveyard and bury them. And we have tears and we shouldn't have tears. We need our fathers and mothers to be by our side out of the mouths of babes, and it's a powerful reminder that this injustice causes profound trauma throughout the community, not least the terrified children. And that is it for our program tonight. Remember, you can always follow me and the show on Twitter. Thank you for watching Amanpour and Company on PBS, and join us again tomorrow night. <laughs>